You guys have been asked this so many times in this past like month, but this is the last time you'll be able to say the theme for the month. So does anyone know what the theme for this month is? If you know it, shout it out loud. Yeah. Excellent job. How many of you went to camp? Okay, a lot of you. How many of you had a great time at camp? Me, okay. Yeah, so our theme for the month is Rooted. And honestly, I'm gonna just jump right into the scripture. Um, but that was an easy question. Does anyone know what the verse for the theme is? Do you know, Isaac? Okay, Jeremiah 17, seven and eight is what I'm gonna go through, but eight, good job. Okay, so um, also, side note, if you're taking notes, I don't see a lot of notes, but that's okay. If you're taking notes, um, the Lord kind of switched my message up on me. So we're going to title this at the end and see if um, he gives me a title for this message. Um, but we're going to start in Jeremiah 17, 7. And it says, the person who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence indeed is the Lord, is blessed. He will be like a tree planted by water. It sends its roots out towards a stream. It doesn't fear when heat comes and its foliage remains green. It will not worry in a year of drought or cease producing fruit. Okay, I have a couple questions for you guys. Who does it say is like a tree planted by the stream? We're going to leave it up there so there's like a cheat sheet for you guys. Oh, there we go. Thanks. Um, who does it say is like a tree planted by the stream? What type of person? There we go. It's up there. Vela. Yeah, the person who trusts in the Lord. Okay, and then what does it say that that tree does? In the next verse, yeah, here's your cheat sheet. What does it say that that verse does? I mean, that tree does. Exactly, okay? So it sends its roots out towards the stream. So in this analogy, we've heard it said by a lot of our speakers, um, we are the tree. If we trust in the Lord, we are the tree. That's who we are in this analogy. And this stream, though, is Jesus, right? Our living source of water is Jesus. So as Christians, as people who trust in the Lord, our roots are supposed to be sent towards Jesus. And I think it's really cool because the tree knows where its roots are supposed to go, right? The tree is sending its roots out towards the most important source, which is the water. And as I was looking up um, all the stuff about trees, as you do to prep for a message, um, it talks about how water is so important because every other element can't be absorbed by the tree unless it's in the water. So the water puts all other minerals all other elements in a form that's usable by the tree to then be absorbed. So all of those things are great, but without the water, they're useless. And so for us as Christians, there can be good things, but if we're not rooted in Jesus, those good things are kind of pointless because they're not from Jesus, right? Okay, I'm taking it back. <laughs> okay. Um, sorry, sometimes when I get nervous, I talk really, really fast. Um, but so yeah, as Christians, we should be connected to the source, which is Jesus. Um, but I kind of want to focus on the end of that scripture today. So in verse 8, it says, um, it doesn't fear when heat comes and its foliage remains green. This is the part. It will not worry in a year of drought or cease producing fruit. So reading that, it tells me two things. One, seasons of drought are going to come. Um, and honestly, it sucks. It would be nice if we never had experienced drought or hard times. But this tells us seasons of drought are going to come. And Mia actually had a really, really good message on Wednesday night about what we do in those seasons. What do we do in the storm? So if you weren't here for that, go to Spotify, listen to it. I don't know if it's on Spotify, but um, go listen to that message because it was really good. Um, okay, so it says that we're going to go through drought, but then it has a kind of a promise attached to it. So we will, it will not worry in a year of drought, but it won't cease producing fruit. So that tells me that even in the drought, even in the hard times, we can still be productive. We can still produce fruit. And the type of tree that's able to withstand a drought is a tree whose roots are the deepest. So a tree who has shallow roots, honestly, in the drought, it's probably going to dry up, right? Like, it's probably not going to withstand the drought. But when it has deep roots that are connected to the stream, we are going to be able to withstand in the seasons of drought. Um, so I actually just want to share a little bit of my story with you guys, because I think it's good for you guys to see, um, us as your leaders, we struggle with things, but the Lord's walked us through things and he's still walking us through things. Um, but there are things that we struggle with that you may struggle with. And if my testimony can help you guys, then I'm all for sharing it. <laughs> okay, let me get water. Okay. 
Okay. So, a little bit about me. I grew up in a Christian family. I have three sisters. Um, I went to Christian school. My life was constantly infused with Jesus, which I'm really thankful for. Um, but there was something that I, at an early age, started to struggle with. Um, I constantly struggled with fear. I would be like a four-year-old little kid waking up with nightmares, going to my parents' room, knocking on their door. I had a nightmare. Can you pray with me? Can I sleep on your floor? Um, and that honestly lasted so long. Um, and so I knew Jesus, but I, here I am, a kid, teenager, struggling with this fear. Um, and eventually my parents, I think they just got super tired of me waking them up. So they were like, we're just going to teach Jazz scripture and tell her she should just quote the scripture whenever she feels scared. <laughs> but they actually were teaching me how to root myself. So there was obviously purpose in it, but I think a little bit selfishly, they didn't want me to wake them up. Um, but so I remember waking up and waking them up and getting to a point, though, that I remember having a nightmare, waking up and being like, okay, for God did not give me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. God did not give me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And I had to battle with this, okay, I feel fear. I see these images that were from my nightmare, but God didn't give me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. It also says, fear not, for I am with you. So at a young age, I began to have to root myself into the truth of who God is and who he said I am because my feelings were telling me opposite. And we're going to get to that because I'm going to talk about what we shouldn't root ourselves in in a little bit. Um, so fast forward, middle school. Honestly, I hated middle school. So if you're in middle school and you love it, praise God. If you hate it, you're going to get out of it soon. So, <laughs> and talk to us leaders about it. Um, I didn't like middle school, but whatever, it was quick. And then I got to high school. Um, honestly, I enjoyed high school. But my senior year, making the decision of where to go to college was so hard. Um, it was honestly the first time I ever experienced, like, a true anxiety attack, um, making that decision, because I was just so afraid. So that fear that I had when I was little came back in just a little bit of a different form as I um, became older. Um, so I remember, like, being so anxious and, like, God, am I going to make the right decision? And I had to come back to truth. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in a future, right? So here I am again, worried and fearful of the future. But if I'm rooted in truth, I don't actually have to be scared of it, right? And I know there's things that you guys are going through that, um, guys, the Bible addresses. It's so important to be in your word because that's where we're going to find truth. Um, so then I went to college. A lot happened during college, but um, one of the biggest struggles I had was anxiety. So for a year and a half, I had constant anxiety. Um, waking up, if you've had anxiety, you know the feeling. If you haven't, then it's a little bit hard to explain. Um, but you wake up, and there's a pit in your stomach, and your chest is heavy. And every single day for a year and a half, that's how I woke up. Um, I wouldn't want to go to bed because I knew that waking up, I would feel that way again. Um, and I remember getting to a point one day where I cried out to Jesus. And I was like, God, I hate struggling with this. Like, this sucks. And I feel like I'm rooted. And I feel like I'm abiding. And I'm reading the scripture. And I'm watching the sermons. I'm asking my parents for prayer. And it's still here. Again, it's just like the fear I dealt with when I was little, just in different form. So he's like, Jasmine, you have the tools. You know what to do. And I was like, okay. He didn't give me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Um, but in that moment, there was one specific night I was kneeling in my dorm room, and I was crying, and I was like, God, what do I do? And he said, Jasmine, if this never goes away, he was very specific. He said, if this never goes away, am I still good? And I was like, yeah, God, you're good. Like, I know you're good. I know your goodness. I know you're good. Okay. And if it never goes away, will you still declare my goodness? And I was like, oh, because it's one thing to know, but then to speak about it and tell other people about it, I was like, I had to pause, if I'm being real. I had to pause, and I was like, yeah, God, if this never goes away, I will still declare your goodness. He's like, okay. And at that point, I wish it just like went away, but that was what, two months in? And I said a year and a half. So we still had a long, long way to go. But in that, my roots kept going deeper and deeper, even though I didn't necessarily feel the peace, even though I didn't necessarily feel like everything was okay. I knew that the God I serve gives peace. That surpasses all understanding. I knew the God I served had a plan for everything, and he works all things together for the good of those who love him and walk according to his purpose. Um, so in those seasons, uh, it was kind of like a drought for me. 
it was a season where I was like, God, I don't feel you, but I'm going to continue to trust. And was I perfect? Absolutely not. <laughs> there were times where I doubted. There were times where I was like, God, are you even in this? Um, but I knew the character of God. So one of the things that I, as I was prepping, God was like, Jazz, you knew my character, but I'm going to give a little bit of an analogy. So imagine Bella comes to me and says, hey, Jeffrey, she's trustworthy. It's like, okay, that's cool. Bella thinks Jeffrey's trustworthy. And then someone else comes and, okay, maybe another person thinks Jeffrey's trustworthy. But until I experience the trustworthiness of Jeffrey, it's not going to be super real to me, right? Like, I'm going to be like, maybe I can trust her. But once I've experienced Jeffrey being trustworthy, then I know I can trust Jeffrey. It's the same thing with God. I can tell you every single day, God is good. He's trustworthy. Your leaders can tell you. You can read scriptures in the Bible, all good things. But other people's experiences aren't enough to keep you rooted. You have to experience Jesus. You have to experience the goodness of God for yourself, right? And here, we're here as tools, um, as people to help. The stories in the Bible, we're going to talk about some of them. Those are incredible tools for us. But if I don't experience the goodness of God for me, I'm not going to stay rooted because the storms are going to come, trials are going to come, and what I rooted myself in is all going to kind of go away because it's not in my experience of who God is, right? Okay, so, perfect. Um, I shared that um, just because I wanted you guys to see. The next things I'm going to share are things that I've actually struggled with or I've had to learn from the Lord. Um, so, just so you know that I've been in the same shoes as you and am currently still going and walking through things. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share some things that in those moments I tried to root myself in, but it didn't work. So kind of the like what nots to root yourself in. Um, so the first one is, point number one, you can't be rooted in feelings. Um, I think that so often... Uh, we hear all the time, well, what do you feel like? What do you feel like doing? What do you feel like eating? Be who you feel like. Be who you are, you know? Um, and God was like, Jazz, feelings are good. They're actually indicators for us of where we're at in alignment with him, right? So sometimes we're like, well, there's good feelings and bad feelings. Honestly, I think that sadness, which we would consider a good feeling, can be an indicator. It doesn't necessarily, or I mean a bad feeling. We don't think sadness is good. <laughs> a bad feeling um, can be indicators, right? It's kind of like, I've heard an analogy before, um, that feelings are kind of like the lights on your car. So if you're driving and the, like, ha I'm gonna, my dad's gonna be so disappointed because, um, he's a car person. The caution light or the hazard light pops on. Um, I know that something's wrong with my car or I know that my car needs to be fixed, right? Or the oil light comes on, I know that something needs to be fixed in my car, or I need to call my dad. So that's what that indicator tells me, right? Um, and so what do I do? I take it to the dealership. Emotions and feelings are the same thing. So my emotions can tell me, hey, Jazz, something's out of line, right? For you, you may be super mad about something, be like, I actually don't know why I'm so mad about this. Take it to the Lord, ask the Lord, hey, this is how I'm feeling. Why am I feeling this way? And the dealership isn't going to be surprised and freak out like, oh my gosh, your lights are on. What are we going to do? Okay, they've studied it. They know the car, right? They're going to be like, oh, I know what to do. We need to fix this. Open the hood, look at the engine, blah, 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 blah whatever, right? <laughs> so that's what the dealership's going to do. Our emotions don't surprise God, right? Our emotions, what we're going through, God's not up there freaking out like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, she's panicking. She's has anxiety. Oh, he's not up there doing that. He knows. He's seen it all. Um, and so our emotions are oftentimes indicators to us that we need to check in with the Lord. Um, the other thing about emotions, why we can't be rooted in them, is they are so fickle. One day you're happy, one day you're sad. One day you're confident, the next all you see is insecurity. One day you're on the mountaintop, the next you're in the valley, right? How many of you have been there before? Your emotions up, down, up, down, up, down. Yeah, honestly, it could be in a day. Morning I wake up, I'm really good, I spill my coffee, dang it, my day's ruined, right? Like, they're so fickle, and our God's not fickle. So when we root ourselves in something that changes in an instant, it's kind of like that um, parable about building your house on the sand versus building your house on the rock. Our emotions are like the sand, right? Something's going to come, a storm comes, and they go. We were never meant to build anything on our emotions 
Yet so often, I know I, let my emotions drive decisions sometimes, right? Or we let our emotions take the lead when they were just meant to be little indicators, not actually the driver of the car. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, the other thing is, here's where we're going to pull scripture in, is in Jeremiah 17, 9. It says, there we go. It says, the heart is more deceitful than anything else and incurable. Who can understand it? Okay, so in here, obviously, it's not talking about our physical heart. It's talking about our soul, which we know our soul to be our mind, will, and our emotions. Um, and so what it's saying is our mind, our will, and our emotions are deceitful. They aren't the truth, right? Um, and so as I was thinking about it, I was like, okay, if someone were to tell me, hey, that person Johnny over there is deceitful, I'm not going to believe him, right? I'm going to be like, okay, if he's deceitful, why am I going to believe him? Or why am I going to build my identity off of what he thinks, right? Because someone's told me that he's deceitful. The Bible tells us our emotions are deceitful. Why am I going to build my identity off of how I feel when how I feel can change in an instant? But I know that the Lord identifies me, right? Like, but so often I have built my identity on my emotions. So often I have built my next decision off of how I feel when it's like, okay, it's deceitful, right? Um, and so I was thinking about it, and I was like, so many times we allow ourselves to let the emotions and how we feel run our lives when the truth is in the Bible. So I'm going to go through a couple things of the deceitful things that I've felt before. Um, this is where we're going to go quick with the verses. <laughs> okay, so number one, I don't feel loved. Okay, I don't feel loved, but it doesn't matter if I feel it or not, because at the end of the day, John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world, you're a part of the world, so insert your name there. For God so loved Bella, for so, God so loved Kaylani, for God so loved, insert your name, that he gave his one and only son for you. So you may not feel loved, but there's a God who created the universe, who created you, who loves you. What about, um, I don't feel like I have a purpose. Psalms 139, 13 says, for it was you who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Verse 16 says, your eyes saw me when I was formless. All my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them came to begin. So before you were even born, you had purpose. Before you were even born, the Lord has a destiny for you. So you may not feel like you have purpose. You may not feel that, but your feelings are deceitful. The truth is, he formed you while you were in the womb. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and plan plans to prosper you. This is a different version, but that's okay. Plans for your well-being and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Okay, he has plans for you. So when your feelings come and tell you other, you get to say, feelings be quiet. Say and go. Because at the end of the day, that's not truth. Okay, what about I don't feel strong? Um, in 2 Corinthians 2.10, it says, there we go. Anyone you forgive, I do too. For what I have, I think I gave you the wrong verse. I'm going to read it off of here. Um, it says, that is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insult, in hardship, in persecution, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Okay, when we are weak, God's strength shows up and it shows up big. So there may be a time in your life where you're like, God, I don't feel strong. Guys, it doesn't matter how you feel. The truth is, in your weakness, he is made strong. So therefore, you are made strong, right? Okay. Um, other one, I don't feel seen. That's a very big one that I struggled with. God, I don't feel seen. Okay, Jazz, it doesn't matter how you feel. Did you know one of the names for God is El Roy, which means the God who sees? And he got, that name comes up in the Bible um, when, uh, I need to like speed note this uh, this spark notes this story. Um, so his, this comes up when Hagar, who was Abraham's wife's servant, um, runs away with Ishmael, who was the baby that her and Abraham had. Drama, okay? So they ran away um, because Sarah, Abraham's wife, was jealous, and she's like, you need to leave. So they run to the desert, and they're in the middle of a desert, her and her child, right? And she's like, what the heck? And God shows up and says, I see you. I'm El Roy. I'm the God who sees, right? So there's millions of people on the earth, but he saw her. He saw her needs. And guys, sometimes it's easy to think, God, 
overlooks me or God doesn't see me. But even with the woman with the issue of blood, there was hundreds of people pushing on Jesus, but he took time to see her. God takes time to see every single one of you right where you're at. You don't need to be perfect. You don't need to have it all together. He sees you, okay? So all of those things, I don't feel loved. I don't feel strong. Honestly, in the nicest way possible, it doesn't matter how you feel, okay? And I have to tell myself that too because that's not to invalidate your feelings, but at the end of the day, your feelings aren't truth. Your heart is deceitful, but we know that if we're rooted in truth and we're rooted in Jesus, we're going to be okay. Um, Okay, so point number one was you can't be rooted in feelings, Point number two is you can't be rooted in people. Um, I know when I was going through that time, I would try to cling on to people. My parents, and my sisters, my mentors, friends, all great people, all love Jesus. Um, but Mia actually mentioned it in her, in her message on Wednesday night. Even the best of the best are going to fail. The Bible says that all fall short of the glory of God. All of us are going to fail. Um, and if we fall short and we fail God, of course I'm going to fail humans, right? Like... I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. Um, And I think that the Lord obviously created us to do life with people, to do life in community, to have friends. But when I find my identity in people, when I put who I am in other people, I'm not going to have a very strong identity. Um, I love my parents. Incredible people. They have, like, let me down. I have let my parents down, right? Um, And I think that sometimes as people, it's easy to care so much about what other people think about us. What are my friends going to think if I do this? What is my boyfriend going to think? What is my girlfriend going to think? What is, you know, so-and-so? Or what are colleges? Some of you are high schoolers getting ready to go to college. What are colleges going to think about me? Um, But at the end of the day, that doesn't matter because we should live for an audience of one. And all that means is, at the end of the day, Jesus' opinion of us should be the one that matters the most. Easier said than done. (laughs) I have cared so much about what friends have said. I have cared so much about what my parents think. I have cared so much about mentors. I have cared so much about boyfriends. I have cared so much about all of those things of what do they think about me? It doesn't matter. <laughs> and I'm saying that in like a like nonchalant way because I've truly had to get to a place where it doesn't matter because I've cared so much about it before. Um, and when we're rooted in people, when they fail, our identity gets shaken up. When they let us down, our identity kind of goes into chaos because it's like, well, they don't now think this of me or my feelings or emotions aren't validated by them anymore. Your feelings and emotions were never meant to be validated by them. Your feelings and emotions were never meant to, your identity was never meant to be found in a person, even once you're married. So it's like, oh, a boyfriend let me down or a girlfriend let me down. Even when you're married, you're still your own person rooted in the Lord, right? So our identity, even in the most intimate covenant relationship, isn't meant to be found in other people. It's meant to be solely found in Jesus. And when we try to root ourselves in anyone else other than Jesus, again, it's like the house built on the sand. It's going to fall. It's going to go away. It's not going to be a strong foundation. Okay, and this last one, you're going to have to stick with me a little bit longer. Um, I'm going to explain it. I'm going to say the point, and then I'll explain it. Okay, so point number one was you can't be rooted in feelings. Point two, does anyone remember? You can't be rooted in people. And point number three, you can't be rooted in the visual evidence of fruit. Um, So what I mean by this is sometimes we judge what the Lord is doing in our lives based off of the visual fruit, like what we can actually see. But as I was studying and, like, preparing God was like, Jazz, does an apple tree produce apples all year round? And I was like, "Uh, nope, but let me go look when they produce apples. (laughs) So an apple tree produces apples mid-July through December. Okay, so mid-July through December, you get apples on an apple tree. But what's happening in February when there's no apples on that tree is just as important, if not more important, than the season where they're bearing apples. Because it's gaining the nutrients, it's getting the water, it's gearing up for the season of bearing fruit. And if the tree didn't do that in the off season or the non-fruit bearing seasons, it's not going to bear healthy fruit. Um, And so that kind of brings me to one of my least favorite words, waiting. Um, Because sometimes, I heard a preacher talk about, um, actually this week, he says, sometimes I wish I had the visual 
for you guys. But sometimes we pray for an apple. And God doesn't give us an apple. He gives us a seed. And we're like, okay, God, I prayed for an apple. But you gave me a seed. Like, you didn't answer my prayer. He did. He just didn't answer it necessarily in the way that we wanted or the way that, like, we envisioned him answering it. Um, But I think it's cool because that means that the Lord trusts us and wants to partner with us as he is answering our prayers. He could just give the apple. He could. But when he gives us the seed, it allows us to exercise our faith. It allows us to exercise our trust in him and to, like I said, partner with him in the miracles in the answered prayers that we get to experience. Um, One of the things that also I was thinking about as I was preparing for this is um, that an apple tree, this is a little bit silly, but an apple tree is not standing or rooted thinking, bear apples, bear apples, bear apples, bear apples. It's not thinking about that. It's not having to will itself to bear the fruit. All it has to do is stay rooted. All it has to do is to abide. And that brings me to um, John 15, 4. Hopefully I gave you the right one. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Remain in me and I in you. Just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. Our job isn't to produce fruit. Our job is to abide. Our job is to remain. And as we remain, as we abide, then we'll produce fruit. Because apart from the Lord, I can't produce anything Apart from the Lord, my works, what I try to do, I've tried to will myself to produce fruit. Is that fruit last? No, it doesn't. It may look good for a little bit, but it's not going to be a lasting fruit because it wasn't produced with the Lord. And so um, to abide, this scripture says remain. Other versions say to abide in me and I in you. All that means is to stay present and to rest in, to have a common purpose. Um, And so for us, when we think about the fruit that we want, uh, sometimes we get so caught up in the fruit and we glamorize the fruit when the fruit is simply the result of the roots. And I think that by glamorizing the fruit, we kind of get sidetracked and don't think about the actual process of producing the fruit. The fruit is great, but if I'm not rooted and I haven't learned how to stay rooted in seasons of drought and stay rooted during times where I don't feel like it or stay rooted in times where people fail me, then the fruit is great, but I didn't learn the process. Have you guys heard the quote? Oh, I'm going to butcher the quote now. Um, that says, um, it's, not much, it's not as much about the destination as it is about the journey to get to the destination. So I think with this, if the Lord just gave us the fruit, we wouldn't appreciate the journey to get the fruit. Um, but when we have the seed, I then now understand the process to get to the fruit. I understand the work that went into it. I understand the faith that went into it, the exercise of my trust that went into getting the fruit, right? Um, And another thing is, Anna and I were actually talking about this earlier, is we can be praying for a fruit and we may think that it looks a certain way when the Lord wants to do so much more than that. So when he gives us a seed, a seed can produce multiple apples or multiple fruit, whatever tree we're talking about, you know? A seed can then stem out and branch and produce so much more but we're so focused on this one thing that we want, right? When God answers it in a different way, sometimes we can't even see the blessing that that is. Sometimes the lack of fruit that we can visually see, remember, because even though the fruit isn't on the tree, the tree's still doing work. There's still growth happening. But when we can't visually see a fruit, sometimes we think we're doing something wrong. Sometimes we think, okay, what can I do to fix this, right? Um, But I think that sometimes the not having the visual fruit, um, the Lord's protecting us. The Lord's doing something that we can't always see. Um, In the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth, they wanted a baby. He's a priest, um, and she's his wife, and they wanted a baby, but they're old. They're barren. They hadn't had any kids. Um, But if you don't know the story, they end up, an angel comes to Zechariah saying, hey, you're actually going to have a baby. Surprise. It's not a surprise to the Lord, but it was a surprise to them. Um, and they ended up getting pregnant, and they had John the Baptist, who was Jesus' cousin, and he prepared the way for Jesus in the wilderness. Um, John had to come right at that moment. John couldn't have come earlier. God had the fruit already prepared for John, in this, or for Zachariah and Elizabeth, in a season 
that was divine, that was intentional, that was on purpose, but they didn't necessarily see it. They just had to remain rooted. They just had to trust that at the end of the day, God is going to give, God is going to take away, and in his timing, he will make things happen, right? Was it easy? Probably not. That was probably one of the biggest desires of their heart to be parents, right? There's desires of my heart that I haven't seen come to pass yet, but I have to stay rooted and know when the time is right, the Lord will make it happen. Um, I think, oh, my last point, and then we're going to go into small groups. Um, I think that in the season of waiting, when we're waiting for the fruit, we can get discouraged because we can think um, that waiting is um, like tiring and it's like weary and it's exhausting and all of those things, um, that the waiting season can be hard. However, let's go find the truth of what the Bible says. So in Isaiah 40, 31, it says, um, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Okay. So here what it's saying is those who wait on the Lord will get strength. The waiting season isn't supposed to be draining. It's not supposed to be exhausting. It's not supposed to be discouraging. The seasons of waiting are seasons of preparation. They're seasons for us to get stronger, to get renewed, to get rejuvenated, to get everything that we need from the Lord. Just like that tree, when it's not producing apples, it's soaking up all of the nutrients. It's soaking up all of the necessary things to be able to produce that fruit. That's like us. In the seasons of waiting for the fruit to show, we are soaking up the time with the Lord. He's establishing our character. He's building us up. My little sister said, um, she's like, well, yeah, Jazz, we do have to grow and establish ourselves and build our character because you can't see um, apples on a little sapling. Like on a little sapling, the, the apple's going to crush the tree. Um, and I was like, you're right. There are times where we are not seeing fruit necessarily, the visual evidence of the fruit, because there's always work being done internally. Um, but sometimes we don't see visually the evidence of it. Um, because God's not going to give us fruit that's going to crush us if our character can't sustain it, right? So there are things that the Lord may be working on you, and you've been praying for things, and you're like, God, I want this. I need this. I... God sees. God knows. And he's going to prepare you, and he's going to build you. And your only job is to abide is to rest in the Lord, to deepen your roots into the Lord, because the fruit, that's his job to take care of. That's not your job. You don't will yourself to produce fruit. You abide, and you rest, and you deepen your relationship with the Lord. Read your Bible. Learn what it says about who you are, because in that, that's how you're going to stay rooted through the drought. That's how you're never going to cease producing fruit, because you're so rooted in who God said you are. Um, I'm going to pray, and then We'll split up into small groups if we have time. Dear Jesus, I just thank you for who you are. God, I thank you so much for how much you love us. God, I thank you for every single one of these students that um, they begin to just deepen their roots in you, God. I thank you for this series. We know that it was divine, it was intentional, and it was on purpose, God. So I thank you for all of the messages that have come from camp since camp. Um, that these students won't forget it. God, that seeds have been planted and that seeds will truly begin to take root in their hearts and in their lives, God. God, I just thank you for um, the ability to just abide in you, to just rest in you, to rest in your presence, to just be present with you, God. It is such a privilege and such an honor that the God of the universe wants to be with us, wants to love us and be intimate with us. God, I just thank you um, for these students. Um, bless them, help them have a great week. I mean, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.